So today, I'm here to talk a little bit about design, about designing things, and specifically about designing simple things. So I'm going to start off with a statement. Um, simplicity enables utility. That's basically just a highfalutin way of saying that when we make objects to be as simple as possible, we open up more doors and more opportunities for those objects to be used by people in ways that we didn't anticipate in diverse ways, in interesting ways, in creative ways, um, and to use to an extent that, that we don't have an opportunity to actually take those objects. That's kind of the overarching principle be behind how I design things. I design agricultural equipment. It's uh, you know not a very fancy job. We design ways to grow plants hydroponically. This is without soil, so we're growing plants and uh, in this equipment, we're usually growing, um, growing inside of a greenhouse, something like this. And uh, we design, uh, of course, the equipment to grow the plants and then um, kind of all of the different support equipment around those things. And in my organization, simplicity is what drives everything we do. If we can make something simple, we essentially are empowering people to take our products and use them in really unique ways. In the process of design, I've learned three lessons. I'm, I've learned more than that, but I'm gonna start with three lessons today. And I'm gonna kind of go through the story of um, one of the first products that I created and how that process taught me these three lessons. So the first lesson that I wanna mention is uh, the idea that simple design is inspired. And uh, I like this one because it's kind of um, smashing some traditional ideas about creativity. When I say inspired, what I'm saying is that when we design things, it's not this you know, incredible um, you know, process where, where uh, it's 100% original. We're taking ideas from a bunch of different places and we're putting them together in unique ways. Uh, Steve Jobs said that creativity is just connecting things. And I like that because it makes the process of creation a little bit more humble, a little bit more accessible, and um, it also tells me that anyone can create really great stuff because everyone has very unique experiences, experiences that are uniquely their own. So um, we take these things, we combine them in unique ways, and uh, hopefully we end up with something that's novel, something that has utility, and something that is very, very simple. The second lesson that I've learned is that simple design needs to be intentional. And um, the reason I mention this is because a lot of people think that the first thing that comes to their mind is the simplest thing, right? It's the, it's the first. Well, that's not necessarily true. The first thing that comes to our mind uh, is simply the first thing that comes to our mind. It's the easiest part of the process. And from there on, it takes a lot of blood and sweat and tears. We have to chop away at things uh, to reduce and reduce and reduce and reduce. So those of us in agriculture were familiar with the act of, um, of pruning. Pruning, uh, it's a brutal thing, let me tell you. You've got this beautiful tree, it's got branches everywhere, and you go through and you just start hacking things off. You're following a, a, you know, there's a rubric for it, there's a pattern, you're doing it a certain way. But it's a sacrificial act. You're chopping off something right now because you know that if I cut this off, I can get more production out of this down the road. This tree will bear more fruit. But that's really unpleasant for us, right? We're, we're, we're destroying something to some extent um, on faith that we're gonna get more out of it. The, pro the process of simplifying is a lot like that pruning process. We're taking things that we intentionally put there, attributes, we're putting uh, functionality into this product, and then we go back and we oftentimes have to hack it out to make it more simple, to make it more usable, to make it more manufacturable. So um, this is the second lesson I learned. The easy part is creating it. The hard part is chopping away um, what we love to make it more and more simple. The third lesson is that simple design kicks open the door to serendipity. It opens uh, new opportunities, not just for us, but for the people that use uh, what we create. And um, this is kind of very closely tied to that last point. When we create simple things, when we strive to make them as easy and accessible and as humble as possible, people are not afraid of them. 
people are willing to use them, people want to interact with them. And once they start doing that, they're able to take what we've created and they're able to apply it in just some of the most amazing ways, totally unexpected. Um, so this is a great thing, but it requires a little bit of generosity and it requires a little bit of letting go if, if you genuinely want people to use what you've created. So, um, kind of one of the first products that I created was, was this vertical tower. And it started about eight years ago. I was, I was facing a problem. It was, it was really just kind of the status quo. I was growing in a greenhouse, and all of my costs were volumetric. That means all of my heating costs, all of my cooling costs, the cost of the structure, the cost of covering the structure, all of this stuff um, that, that costs a lot of money uh, when it comes to growing crops in a greenhouse were all based on the size of that greenhouse, the volume of um, air it contained, basically. And yet I was growing on one plane. So volumetric cost, planar production. And um, this was just, this is the status quo. Everyone grows on a single plane. And the assumption there is that, you know, uh, it's not light that is, uh, light is the most limiting factor in our production. It's not, you know, nutrients, it's not these other things. And I started to kind of question that. I wasn't sure if that was necessarily true. And um, I wanted to produce a little bit more, and I wanted to produce a little bit more and lower my cost. So um, I started to look into volumetric production techniques. So how can we take uh, this volume of space and grow in the volume instead of just growing on a plane? I started looking into some of these other techniques that were out there. There's all these you know, vertical um, towers for growing hydroponically, and they're all clumsy, they're all heavy, uh, they were all fixed in place. Essentially, they didn't meet my needs, they didn't do what I needed them to do. And as I looked at them, I realized that they were just a stratification of horizontal production. People just taking what they're comfortable with, which is growing in pots, growing in trays, and they just stack them up on top of each other, which, you know, whatever. It worked, right? It, you could grow things in it. But growing things is not that hard. Fundamentally, none of these things met my needs. And uh, so I kind of, des I decided that, um, well, as a side point there, it's a great illustration. The enemy of good design is sticking with what you're comfortable with. Not necessarily what you know. It's good to stick with what you know to some extent. But sticking with what you're comfortable with kills good design. And uh, all of the other stuff on the market had really stuck with what they were comfortable with. Um, so I decided that we needed to redesign. And the result was um, this, this tower, this hydroponic tower that, that we use on all of our farms and a lot of our farmers use now uh, to produce food for their communities. But um, this, this was really kind of my first foray into design since I was a kid. You know, when we're kids, we're, we're playing with crayons and rocks and, and dirt, and we're designing things. We're inherently wired for it. Every human being, I, I would argue, it's one of the things that make us human, um, is this compelling need to create things, this compelling need to build. I, it had been a long time since I'd really seriously engaged with that drive. And um, so it, it was a very interesting experience going uh, from zero to 60 and spending so much time just so obsessing, focusing on a single thing and, and trying to just make it work. I was taken back to when I was a kid and when, in my teenage years when I was spending a lot of time outside and I was thinking about um, cliff faces and how these cracks in the rock are just these amazing little ecosystems. They gather soil, they gather um, all of this uh, organic matter in there, moisture, and then a seed lands and a plant starts to grow. And as that plant grows, it's a positive feedback. But the plant creates you know, these uh, roots that, that spread in the crack and it traps more organic matter, it traps more soil. There's microbes growing there. It begins to actually decompose the rock. It cracks the rock open. There's more cracks, more organic matter, more plants. And pretty soon you've gone from this barren rock face to something that's alive, to something that's just covered in life. And I began to think about those cracks and how that works. The plants don't have any problem orienting towards the sun. And that kind of inspired the housing. I began to think about those plant roots and how water can move through them easily, how they're great. They've got a lot of biological surface area, so a fiber has tons of habitat for microbes as opposed to dirt or um, a traditional aggregate. I began to think about that, how water moves through it. And uh, pretty soon I knew that I was looking for something 
that basically resembled a crack in a rock, and I was looking for a material that roughly worked like plant roots. And um, what I ended up with was, this is an illustration here, essentially, of, of what, what it looks like. But uh, it's very simple now. It wasn't necessarily simple when it came out. But at the end of it, what I ended up with uh, was a very simple functional product. And it was that process that really taught me that, you know, I didn't do anything new. Nature's been doing this for a very long time. All I did was observe and then try to replicate it with some uh, new materials. I then spent the next two years um, basically chopping away at this, chopping it down, uh, reducing, 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 making it simpler, figuring out how we can manufacture it, figuring out you know, all these different ways it could be used, focusing on the human element of it. Not just will plants grow here, but how can it be used by people? So when I was done with that, um, that was the intentionality part. I began to think um, that the simplicity of the product began to needle at my imagination. It's impossible to, to obsess about something for so long and then just stop obsessing. It, it's, it, you just you keep going. And um, I began to think about the markets. You know, for, for most markets, 60% of a producer's cost is post-harvest labor and packaging. So when you buy you know, a head of lettuce at the grocery store for a dollar, 60 cents is just plastic and ink. This guy is taking things out of boxes, putting things into boxes, bundling this, washing that, uh, putting it on a shelf. That money doesn't go to the producer. It's, in my opinion, wasted. It's logistic cost. So we started looking at this and saying, you know, we've got these vertical towers. The plants are, you know, stuck in these things. They don't move around very much. What if we just took a grown-out tower directly to the market? What if we just bypass all of this garbage, literal garbage? just took it to market and people could harvest their own product at market. It'd be super fresh and we'd eliminate all the plastic. It'd be really, really simple. Um, and everyone's getting into local foods anyway, so if local foods, uh, people are doing this on a local level, then um, awesome, you know? We can produce a lot of trash, we can deliver value to the producer, we can deliver value to the retailer, they can make more money, and um, the consumer can get a better product. Pretty cool. We started thinking um, about putting these things on the sides of buildings. What if we, you know, it's so simple. What if we just hung it on the side of a building? What if we uh, used gray water from the building to irrigate it? What if we grew plants that cleaned that water? What if we grew microorganisms that remove toxins and pollutants from that water? What if we coated the towers in catalytic compounds that broke down smog? What if we did all these things with this? It, it wouldn't be hard. In fact, actually, it was pretty much all there. So we started looking into this idea of green walls, and uh, the opportunities just blew up. They're endless. We started thinking about models. You know, what kind of businesses could people build around this simple thing, this ridiculously simple little tube? Um, what kind of new businesses could we see? Could we see farmers? You know, what could architects do with it? Landscape designers. What could uh, the traditional uh, nurseries do with it? You know, could we build service models? Could they sell the equipment? Could they sell plant material? What does this look like? And as we started to think about it, we started to realize this is a really big industry. Right? A lot of really big industries all centered around this little thing. The costs were lower, the, the profit potential was higher for all of these people. It was a good deal. We started to think about programs, software, equipment, support equipment, all of this stuff that needed to be made to support all of these applications where we're just basically taking this tower and we're moving it. We're putting it someplace new, or we're growing something new in it. <clears throat> Started to think about all of this amazing equipment that we could start building. Uh, this is a picture of an indoor growing operation that we put in uh, that has the potential to generate about a half a pound of produce per square foot per week. Um, these are herbs, slow growing herbs typically. So we started thinking about all this amazing equipment that we could build to just blow traditional production out of the water. We started thinking about all of the different things other people could do, taking this product and building it in unique places. This is in London. These are folks that are growing on this elevated farm in the middle of London. Very cool. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, what we, what we found was that building this really simple product enabled us to keep building things, lots of things, more things than we can possibly build in a lifetime. The list goes on and on. People are like, are you going to make this for me sometime soon? 
well, maybe next year once I get through the other 20 things, I have to build this here um, for these other 20 people. It allowed us to keep building things. It allowed all of our customers to start building things, automation equipment, all of this amazing, um, amazing stuff. So in closing, when we think about technology, we tend to think about this really high technology. It's intimidating, you know, uh, electronics, chemistry, physics. But we forget that, you know, in ancient Greece, the guy that invented the stylus has probably changed the course of human history more dramatically than a, a Mac computer or whatever your idea of high tech really is. So my encouragement is this. Um, simple things empower people. And I think that everyone has the ability to build simple, everyday objects. I think that everyone has one or two rattling around in their head. So I would encourage you to go home and sketch it out and start building it and think very carefully about how it works and making it simple. Because when we build simple, accessible things, we enable other people to use them in powerful, powerful ways.